one elite team is out to save lives. There's no medical crews on scene yet. Air ambulance is required. We've just been called to a road traffic accident and the reports are that one of the patients is not breathing. These are the men and women who work for the air ambulance. It's taking the hospital to the patient. Open your eyes because it's easier for us to assess you. Okay. Uh, you focus on me, you all right? Yeah, spot on. Require both carriageways closed now. With highly qualified doctors on board, air ambulances bring a hospital intensive care unit to the roadside. We have the skills to stay and play, not scoop and run. Yeah, at the end of the day, it could be our family lying there who needs help. Funded mostly by public donations, air ambulances respond to over 14,000 call-outs a year. Without the public raising money for us, we simply couldn't operate. There you go. It's really, really important to be a team when you're out there. And working with some absolutely brilliant guys. No mind that bollocks, get the kettle on. You do need the banter because you do see some things. Best bit of the day. I absolutely love my job. <laughs> Let's have a good day. RAF Benson, Oxfordshire, home to the Royal Air Force Helicopter Command and to the Thames Valley and Chilton Air Ambulance. Helimed 2 Force patch covers more than 2,000 square miles of Berkshire, Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire. Leading the advanced trauma team on this shift is local GP Dr Simon Brown. Being a GP and working on the air ambulance, I'm part of a dying breed. The new GPs tend not to have the critical care training that's necessary to work on the air ambulance. Myself, um, I've done cardiothoracic surgery, a lot of neonatal work and paediatric work before I moved into general practice. With 14 years of call-outs under his belt, Simon is the longest serving doctor on the air ambulance team. We can be sitting here quietly and then um, a few minutes later we can be going to try and help save someone's life. The crew have been called to an early morning road traffic accident in rural Oxfordshire. So yeah, the last update, um, a couple had head injuries, right. um, and he had asked for three DMAs as well, so I, d I don't know anymore. Okay, I'll have a look. Perfect. Control um, related to us that there were three DMAs, which is dual manned ambulances, which will have paramedics and technicians on. And um, we knew they were all already on scene, and they had actually requested for us to attend. So we knew that there was the potential that there was going to be some serious injuries. You've got one, two, three ambulances there. We got a very good um, sort of aerial picture of it, and we could see a car on its side in a river that was sort of half submerged. A family car with mum, dad and two teenage daughters has left the country road, plummeting 30 feet into the river. First casualties out there. So where's the rest of them? The second one's just coming. Right, OK. Through there. I've got you. So they've gone yeah. a fair old way, haven't they? Yeah. 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 That's not an easy scene at all, is it? And the barriers there, they've breached the yeah, barrier the somehow. Barrier. She saw them airborne. Right, OK. Right. Yeah, airborne right. across the road. So. What we'll do is we'll assess each of them as yes. they come out. Then we've got three vehicles so, plus us, so we'll take one. Yeah. We've got more than one. Do we have eight yet? Do we have for the doctor? Oh, yeah. OK, that's fine. In a multi-casualty incident, um, the main role of the doctor is triage, really, to decide which patients need treatment now. OK, so I'm looking, if you, if you look to take her on your vehicle then, okay. that'd be fine. I'll, I'll assess the others as they come out. How do you 
teeth feel? If you run your tongue over your teeth, do any of them feel sharp at all? No, okay. And just open your eyes for me, just have a look at your pupils there. Okay, that's good. You're going to grab a line on... I'll stick a line yeah, in there and, and then, then we we'll, can move on. Yeah, and I'll assess them with the others back. too as they come out. <laughs> right, yeah, equal air entry on both sides, good. so I'm happy um, that which I'm happy for us to, you to take a by road. So far we've got, that's really mechanism only yeah, on there. Yeah. This one we've got really pelvis, query, hip and a, and a facial injury. Right. You might think your head go a bit swinny, but that's we'll, fine, we'll, we'll, all right? Of the three people that were there, um, mum was the most serious. The pelvic fracture particularly can cause a lot of really quite catastrophic, life-threatening internal bleeding. I waited until the dad came out before we made the final decision on who to move to hospital first. Yeah, uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, no. He was covered in a lot of blood, obviously had a head injury, um, but he was conscious and, and moving. We're gonna, we're gonna take, take him as he is, yeah. We assess mum and her injury pattern and we, we realised it would probably be best that she was going to be the one that we were going to treat and we were going to fly down um, to the John Radcliffe. Yes, please, Alf, cheers. It's a little job for you. I don't know if you want to. Mm -hmm. Just get the thumb. So again. All right, yes. You, you, you just dislocated your thumb on this side. Oh. Yeah. <coughs> well, okay. What I'm going to do is gently pull on it and then we'll just pop that back into place. If it's better, really yeah. painful, let me know. Pop well, back into, there we go. Well, if you use these fingers just to hold that thumb in place, then it won't pop out again. Yeah. The idea is to make sure that everybody's treatment has been started and is going well before I leave the scene with the most critical patient. No, that's good. Thank you very much for your help. That's a good job. Thank you. Cabin doors, harnesses, we are all secure in the back. By helicopter, Mum June will arrive in just 10 minutes at the major trauma centre at the John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford. The rest of her family are taken by road. Really, they, they were lucky to, to get out alive. It's possible that Mum was unconscious initially after the impact, and if you're unconscious underwater, then you will, you will drown. Holiday. Just uh, driving back from Luton this morning, so yeah, I think they left the road just before the barrier starts. From the look of it, gone through the trees and then, yeah, it must have been pretty scary. Yeah. June. She's 52 years of age. She was the driver of this car that's left the road and they've gone about 30 foot down into a river. She's maintaining her airway. We've got no ABC problems. Top to toe, she's got an obvious black eye and some blood around her nose. Complaining of pain around her right lower abdomen into her hip. Also, she had a dislocated thumb that Simon popped back in. All right. Thank you. Cheers, love. Durham Tees Valley Airport in Darlington, home to the Great North Air Ambulance. This is HQ, nerve center of operations. <laughs> what do you want, Jean? Do you want a, uh, a coffee white one, please? Coffee white one. You're a very, very small team, and if you don't get on, it's just a disaster. What the it's hell is in that? there? Is it? I thought you said you want water. <laughs> Working here is an experience. This is a uh, this is the doctor's version of a black coffee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what did you want? Was it coffee? Well, I'll do it myself, he doesn't even mix the drugs. Do you think we trust him with that? No, that's uh, definitely the paramedic's job. Uh, so we'll go and uh, we'll go and see if we can get him to uh, rectify his mistakes so far, and then we'll send him out in a helicopter saving people's lives.
so to be honest. Yeah, no worries. Jane will uh, crew request for uh, open lower leg. Uh, yeah, I'll be heli med 6 Yeah, reposition. Yeah. Where is it roughly? Uh, Booze back, Lingdale. The casualty's injury is so severe that the road ambulance crew have requested Helimed 63 because they urgently need a trauma doctor. So just ground taxi now, left turn and hover taxi out to the right. All good in the green. Hospital trauma consultant and army medic Dr. Mike Davison works in some of the world's toughest war zones. Every time I go, I learn new techniques and we can bring them back to the UK and, and filter them in. It's one of the reasons now that we're seeing unexpected survivors in the Northeast, you know, who are victims of, of major trauma, and we've not seen that before. When there's a battle to save a limb, having a specialist trauma doctor on board can make all the difference. We've got a female who's fallen off a horse, sustained a broken leg. Allegedly, there's bones um, poking out of uh, the flesh. The rapid response vehicle. Yeah, what well, you've seen. Each member of the team brings a different skill to the party, I suppose. And I guess nobody's really ultimately in charge. Um, just about the three of us working together. Happy days, we are there. I would say we respond to at least three or four horse riding injuries per week. It can range from serious brain injuries um, to broken necks to broken backs, you know, with resulting paralysis, you know, which can affect a patient for the rest of their life. I'm Mike, nice to meet you. I'm one of the doctors. This is Andy, this is a paramedic. Female jockey Jess has been thrown by her horse and sustained an open fracture to her left leg. We were just coming up the gallop on the horse um, and there were only young horses. Um, and it just had a little play and a buck and as young horses do. And then a pheasant flew out and that spooked the horse even more. It's broken above the ankle. But it's broken off, but it's, uh, it but might it's be. it's also yeah. off-ended slightly, hasn't yeah. it? The important thing is not to be distracted by the leg. Sure you haven't hurt yourself anywhere else? Is she stable? Is she bleeding into her chest? Is she bleeding into her belly, her pelvis? A's fine, B's fine, C's fine. fine. Luckily for her, all them areas were, were clear, so actually at that point, we can concentrate on her leg. So, what exactly? Did the horse rear and did you come off? No, it doesn't flew out. It's it just... So you went over the top and landed on your, on your, your foot, basically? Sort of like, over the top. G, just to let you know, we'll, we'll, take, we'll be taking this girl to, G, to James Coop. Yeah, she's got a, nah, have you seen her leg? She's got a, an open fracture of her ankle. They're often associated with no blood supply to the foot, okay, so you can lose your foot from that. So at that point, really, it's a case of how do we protect the blood supply of that foot. What we want to do is get the bone back in the skin um, as, as quickly as we can. So we're going to get some um, fairly strong pain relief, okay? And then we're going to try and get your foot in a bit of a more comfortable position. Okay. Have you ever had anything like, like ketamine before? Or? Mm. Okay. okay. It makes you feel pretty spaced out, pretty strange, okay? One of the things that sets us um, apart from the, the road ambulance is, is uh, by having a, a specialist trauma doctor. We can provide different interventions and a wider range of specialist drugs. It may well be that you actually don't remember any of this, okay? This is one of the best painkillers that you'll ever have, so this is really good. This will take away your pain, all right? Ketamine kind of dissociates the brain, so it actually unplugs your sight, your hearing, um, your pain. So it means that for a limited period of time, maybe for five or six minutes, I can do something to somebody like try to reduce a, a broken limb and it'll not cause them a lot of distress. And we'll just totally relax and let this struggle work better. Right, oh, I'll come and do the counter Yeah, Andy? Yeah. Another two of that ketamine. Another 20. Yeah. Yeah. Just to finish with you, mate, just to Everybody will react to drugs in different ways. I gave this girl about three times the normal dose of ketamine that I would give her an 80 kilogram British soldier. Give her another 20. Well done, ah. 60, 60 ketamine, so that's quite, that's quite a lot. She didn't react to a normal way to the ketamine. I just took a bigger dose to get the, the effect that I needed. Right, Jess, we'll give you another minute, just let, you the, let this uh, medicine work. And then what we'll do, I'll just see if I can get this bone back in your leg, OK? All of us cope pretty well with it, you know. We've got a job to do on scene. And where you would speak to someone who may be standing back and witnessing 
horrific injuries and horrendous things. We're not standing back and witnessing it, we're doing something with it. Just gonna just try to fix your leg for you, all right? Are you ready with that, mate? We're so focused on the job, I don't think there's time when your mind's working that way for emotion. Take some nice deep breaths. It's still offended, isn't it? Yeah, that'll not, that'll not reduce. I think we'll have to reduce it in theatre. We have to know where to draw the line and sometimes the things that we do don't work as well as we'd like. How are you doing there, Jess? All right? Unable to reposition the bone, and with the chance Jess could still lose her foot, getting her to hospital swiftly is vital. What we're going to do now, OK, we're just going to put you on a, a, a stretcher and we'll take you to the helicopter, OK, and we'll fly you into Jimmy Cook's. All right. I told you it was nice medicine I gave you. I guess all the medical stuff, the jargon, all the, the, the activity going on around them isn't anything that they necessarily are interested in. Very often all they want is for someone to tell them it's going to be all right. That's the worst over. You've done really well, Jess. Let you know what's happening, mate. Yeah, mate. Hey, Jess, go ahead. Yeah, Jen, just an update for you. It's not reducing, so you go to James Cook. Um, I'll give you full details in about two minutes. Yeah, Roger, thanks. Over. All right, are we good? Yeah. All right, we'll go on three. One, Strong. two, three. Heavy. <laughs> Dr. Mike has given Jess a high dose of ketamine. It's not just a painkiller, but a sedative. I don't even know what's going on. <laughs> Honestly, don't. Lauren, I know that. That, that was Lauren laughing. <laughs> I recognise that laugh. That's Lauren. <laughs> Anything else, I don't know. Would you be all right? Have a, have a sleep on the journey. Yeah, she's out of it. Thanks, Lauren. Oh, correct. Don't leave me on my own. Hmm? Don't leave me on my own. No, I'm with you all the way. I'm your doctor. Oh, I feel funny. I don't like this experience. It's all about reassurance and trust, you know. That girl's life and her limb, I suppose, in my, is in my hands, really. So she's got to trust me, and that comes from communication. OK, Jess, we're just going to take off. You just relax, OK? It's only a 10-minute flight to James Cook Hospital, but the drugs are already starting to wear off. Ketamine is very good, an excellent painkiller, uh, but it does remove you from reality. And once your senses start to come back, you, you know, you can hallucinate and you can show some quite bizarre behaviour. It is very important that a doctor keeps the patient calm. Thinking of um, when you travel with children in the car um, and they all start squabbling and things like that and you're trying to calm them down a bit, I suppose it's a little bit like that. Um, it can distract you. G, you'll have to be um, just careful on um, just on landing if you can do a nice smooth one. Just just a little bit jumpy. What are you trying to say? Yeah. Uh, don't do your usual. It's okay. Just relax. Lovely, G. Didn't even feel it. That's a normal one. Minute two two. Right, nice and careful because she's still in bit of pain with her, oh. her leg. Okay. Hold on. Air desk, go ahead. Yeah, Jim, we are now clear at James Cook. Roger, thanks. Um go on, James. Hello. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Um 
This is this is Jess. She's um, 27. She fell off a horse. She's got an, an open fracture of a tibia and it's displaced out um, medially. Um, head to toe, no other injuries, and she's totally stable. We've given her. I gave her 60 of ketamine to try to reduce it, and to be honest, it doesn't uh, it doesn't budge budge at all. In total, now she's had 100 of ketamine, but spread out over about 45 minutes, so she's still a little. She should be quite well in analgesia, but a little bit high. Yes. Not working yet. Let on in the week, so if you're still in, I'll check on you. Right, see you later. Hi. You're all right. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> In the south of England, at RAF Benson, it's time to refuel. Working with uh, Dr. Brown today, who uh, has got a little bit of a sweet tooth. He likes a little bit of sugar in his coffee. Any kind of junk food he loves. Sweets, chocolates, anything. Goods, anything like that. He doesn't actually eat proper food. I've yeah. never actually known him to eat a salad. For a doctor who a weighs meat. like about ten stone, yeah. it's amazing really. I think yeah. he gets a bit worried if his if his blood sugar drops below twenty-five. I think yeah. I think he has to have ah. another Another, yeah. another wagon wheel. We're going to have a scientific experiment between the traditional and the jammy to see which people prefer. Not looking, Jerry, are you? No. Oh. You have to tell me. Oh, oh, oh. Blind tasting. Oh, I have to join you, of course. Do you ever check your blood sugar? No, it's fine. <laughs> Trust him, he's a doctor. He knows what he's talking about. That's right. Do as I say, not as I do. Yeah. is called to a paraglider. His chute has apparently collapsed and he's fallen several hundred feet. The patient has not been located, but his injuries are potentially serious. The accident is near Basingstoke, 30 miles from base. Benson, traffic has been 24 Alpha lifting spot 16 for Southland departure. Look at the article, Chuck, do you want to say? Yeah. When we're on a search and rescue type mission, Jerry and Simon would be assisting me in navigating, uh, but also scouring the ground, uh, looking in flight for any other hazards. Uh, paraglider at one o'clock. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's keep a really good look at that paraglider over there. Yeah, we've got it. Access wise, we may be the first resource on scene, depending on how close to the road he is. If he's gone in the woods, I'd expect us to see his canopy, but uh... if he has fallen through the trees, you'd, we're never going to see him from up here. That's the only problem. I mean, presumably, it's people in the pub who saw him go down. I'm just wondering whether they've seen that that guy that we saw yeah. flying around who swooped yeah. down yeah. and then got back up again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's starting to feel like a wild goose chase. We searched for about half an hour and uh, we didn't find anything. I think we've had a good look. I think we'd call it at this point, don't you? Roger, thanks for that. Uh, we'll resume... Uh, uh, back to our fence and suspend uh, search. We'll put that down to a well-meaning member of the public. Yeah. I thought we were going to get a job there. I thought that was going to be the one. Yeah. Oh, that was a couple of grand, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. How many hours were we not? That's about an hour yeah, that was and ten minutes, was it? About an hour. Bang on. And 200 kilograms of fuel. Whenever somebody's life is at stake or is on the line, uh, we'll do everything that we possibly can to fully investigate and fully respond to whatever that incident is. But it's an expensive operation. Each mission costs in the region about two, two and a half thousand pounds. So yeah, it can be very, very frustrating when we don't find anything. Although they never found the paraglider, they did find out what happened to him. 
the police went along to the pub to have a chat to the people who'd put the 999 call in. Uh, when the police arrived at the pub, they noticed a man sitting at the bar with a paraglider in the big bag next to him. And they asked him how long he'd been there, and uh, he said yes, he'd been flying over the pub, and it looked like a nice pub, it was Sunday lunchtime, and so he made a sharp turn, quickly descended to the ground, put his parachute in the bag, popped in the pub to order lunch. Because we don't know what the day is going to hold and uh, we don't know when we're going to get our next meal, we can be, uh, become a little bit obsessed about food. Doesn't look very nice either, does it? Sausage rule. Andy looks like butter wouldn't melt, but uh, Andy can actually be a little bit feisty. Most of the time when I get that bread, it's the crust splits off the top of it. So I took pictures of it and I sent a complaint. That was weeks ago and they haven't even acknowledged me yet. So I wrote a very polite and very factual letter about this continuing problem with their bread. So as indicated by the cursor, very often you get what I describe as a lateral fault line <laughs> uh, running across the slice. This is the problem here, Matt. And then it results in... Look at that mess. <laughs> How can... It's terrible. And he's a bit of a joker, <laughs> but uh, he can be serious when he needs to be. The incoming call is a suspected heart attack, and the patient needs an urgent transfer to hospital from a remote farm location in Northumberland. Right. Air uh, Ottawa is currently pleased 95 and 50. Mm, a little bit, little bit low. Which is quite low. Andy and Mike need to decide if it's serious enough to prioritise. It's critical that we send the helicopter to the patient that needs us most, and the paramedic on the control desk can use their experience, their medical knowledge, uh, to make that judgement, to make that decision. It's a bit of a sort of way of doing it. Go. In the rear. You always worry with a farmer because they're very stoical. They don't, they don't admit pain and they don't ask for help. So you know if a farmer is feeling ill or he's asking for help, it's normally something very serious. Be there in about 10 minutes. There'll be about a 10% chance. And he the heart might have stopped and we might have to try to get it going again. With a heart attack, the longer the heart muscle is without oxygen, the worse the prognosis is. So, you know, speed is absolutely vital. Is that an ambulance at the far end of the far farm? That's that's, that's, it, it? that's, yeah, that's it, yeah. the one there, see the red building? The yeah, just next to that. The thing with a heart attack is as soon as you put any effort into anything, the pain will get worse because your heart needs more energy and that's when it'll, it'll hurt more. So anything emotional, any kind of movement will all increase the pain. So often these patients are, they're, they're, they're quite still, they do want to move around and they're quite calm. Hey, how are you doing, sir? I'm Mike. Right. What happened to you today? Do you feel when you come up? feel short of breath or anything? Yeah. Yeah? You ever had anything like this before when you've been working on the farm or anything? Yeah. No, nothing at all. Your mum, dad, brothers, anyone like that, did they ever have heart attacks? Uh, my dad died when I was 24. My mother died when I was 27. Was that through heart problems or? Although he looked fairly well, his heart wasn't very well. His heart trace um, showed that he'd had a heart attack. We know with a heart attack that his heart can fail or, or even stop. So it was important to get him to the right place um, quickly. And that right place is the Freeman Hospital um, in Newcastle. So just to smooth the process, um, I phoned just to make sure that everything was arranged. Just looking at this fella's uh, ECG, to me, he looks a little bit suspicious. Um, he's got uh, flip T's and he's got ST depression. Um, he's got high blood pressure, and probably most importantly, his mum and his dad both uh, died of heart attacks. Yeah, I think he's definitely had a cardiac event. Um, I look at his ECG. So I reckon we could leave here within about seven or eight minutes. All right, mate, thanks very much. Cheers, bye. 
So these gentlemen have done all the hard work, all right? Now, what I've got to do is I've got to take it really serious with you, just because of your parents, you know. Um, genetics don't, don't lie, all right? What we're going to do is fly you into to Newcastle, all right? There's a specialist heart unit there. What they'll do, they'll assess you, OK? If there is actually a little heart attack there, you know, they can do a few things just to reverse that, all right? The, question, the, the, the thing we've got to do is get you there fast. Any, any questions about the plan? All right, good man, you'll be fine, all right? We can get patients to hospital really fast. We're talking 15 minutes as opposed to an hour and a half by road. This gentleman needs to go to the Freeman Road Hospital, which doesn't have its own landing site. Um, so we have to land in a plane field nearby. So I need Andy back at base to organise an ambulance to transfer the patient. Yeah, it's all copied call. Um, <clears throat> I'll sort an ambulance out. Paddy Freeman's 15 minutes. Thanks, mate. We'll reverse away from the wires. And I've got Mike in the back looking after the patient and looking after any medical emergencies. That's the helipad down there, the uh, field. Permanent. Yeah, transmitting. It's my job to fly the aircraft, but I rely on the other guys to help with navigation and also to listen and to look out um, to keep us clear of any hazards. And there's somebody sat on the seat over in the corner where we're going. Archer. Just these horses as well down in the 12 o'clock. Yeah. Just gently roll it forward. I've not got a great leverage yet. No, yeah, that's me. Brian's condition is stable, so Mike's happy for the ambulance paramedic team to take him the short distance to hospital. Right, Brian. Do you mind if I say goodbye to him? Right, good luck, Brian. OK? I'll see you later. You'll be fine, all right? Cheers, chaps and chappies. One in ten patients like that will cardiac arrest in the back of the helicopter, so the fact that we've got him here is remain stable is a really, really good sign. When it comes to hearts and um, brains with strokes, you know, minute, minutes is often crucial. And hopefully it'll make a big difference to his survival. OK, back uh, right, we go. It's near the end of a 10-hour shift. The crew of Helimed 63 are responding to an emergency call. 63 are lifting to that job. Well, I wasn't going to bother putting my tea on, but I think I will now. Of course, everyone looks forward to getting home, but we do a serious job you know, with permanent consequences, really. So if there is a job that looks like it, it, you know, it needs to be done, you can ask any doctor in the country, we, we'll, we'll fly to it. At the end of the day, it could be our family lying there who needs help. They're heading for Gilling West in North Yorkshire, 12 miles southwest of base. A nine-year-old boy has smashed into a wall on a motorbike. Treating children, it is quite difficult. Um, the children are scared, really scared. Certainly if there's a job that I have butterflies in my tummy going to, you can guarantee it'll be a, a job with a, with a, ch a young child. I wonder if you're wearing a helmet. Yeah, I wonder. That's a crucial difference. Oh, good, yeah. Between brain and no brain. These are all always the most difficult jobs, you know. Children, obviously there's an emotional aspect which you, you try to keep detached from. Right, you're all clear at 12 o'clock. Oh, okay, man. Oliver, I'm Mike. I'm going to be your doctor, all right? How old are you now? No. Now, where's your pain at the moment? Yeah. Just in your arm. All right. Well, I'm going to leave that to last. I want to just check the rest of you over first, all right? Okey -dokey. Luckily, Oliver was wearing a helmet, 
but Dr. Mike is concerned he may have hidden injuries. The secret is not to be distracted by the arm. He's been on a motorbike and he's collided with a wall and he's been ejected over the top of a wall. Okay, so you expect serious injuries. Good lad. If I squeeze the ankles, does that bother you? Yes, Looks great. Right, we'll keep, keep you nice and warm. I think you've got a flight. We'll have a little look at this arm. All right, good lad. Well, I think you have broken your first bone. OK. <laughs> yeah, I'm a father myself, and actually that helps. Once you're a father or a mother, you learn how to communicate with different ages of children, so you use different speech. And once you get um, a child's trust, you know, that's, 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 that's part of the battle, really. But what we'll do, we'll put a, a nice splint on it, and what I'll do is I'll put a little needle in the back of your hand. It's not, not a big thing. A big, brave boy like you will be fine. And then it just means I can give you some decent painkillers, OK, and make the pain go away. OK? All right? Come on, you've been so brave so far. OK? Oh, I can get rid of your pain then. It's worth it. If you were my boy, he's exactly your age, called Daniel, I would, I would do this to him, OK? And I'll, I'll treat you just like one of my boys. You don't have to look squeeze. As a paramedic, it is really important to try and stay one step ahead of the doctor so that he has that equipment and he has the drugs, etc., that he needs to deal with the patient. Nice and still for me, OK? <laughs> nice and still, so don't you move, OK? Oh. Right. Oh. Oh. Children, they always cause anxiousness. There's nothing worse than seeing your own child injured. So in a way, it's treating the child. It will not hurt or anything. It's also treating the parents. You'll be fine, though. I'll look after him as if he was my own. He's worth spying. He's a good oh, boy. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, so he's, he's a, a brave boy. soldier. He's a very good boy. I like him. How's that painkiller? Is that, was that helping you, the one that I gave you? Yep. Does your arm hurt much now? Uh, it feels better. Oh, good. Here we go. Right, well, we'll put it in this splint now. Blank it over. Yeah. Thanks. Oops. Don't want that. Ollie, we'll come you down, OK? OK, you're going to get a little helicopter ride, OK? And then we're going to be, we're going to be straight to the hospital with you, OK? All right? It is hard on parents when, when we tell them, sorry, we can't take you. But then, as a crew, we just try to reassure them that the child's OK and um, they're in good hands. So I don't want to see any problems, OK? He has, he has broke his wrist, yeah. what we'll do though, when we get him in the hospital, I'll be cleaned up, we'll x-ray it, we'll just see how bad the break is. If the bone has come out the skin, what we'll need to do is take him to the theatre tonight and, and fix that, OK? okay. Will, he, will he use his arm again, or...? Oh, God, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, kids, boys are boys, you know? Yeah. That's this is what they do, all right? But he'll be fine, OK? And you can totally trust him with me, OK? Right. It's another trip to the James Cook Hospital in Middlesbrough. Oliver's mum and dad will drive the 30 miles. This is something to talk about when you go back after half day. <laughs> you excited? I am as well. You okay? Hi, it's Great North Air Ambulance Service. Back at base, Paul's let the hospital know that the team's on their way. Very nice, yes. It's a lot like a Jal Frazee, but it's not. I don't know where it is. Well then, this is young Oliver, he's nine year old. At 1900 he was riding a, like a children's motorbike uh, with a helmet on and he hit a wall, probably about two foot high. He was ejected over the wall, okay. Injuries wise, he's got an open fracture of his right wrist. He wasn't knocked out. Um, and his primary survey essentially is uh, totally clear. Can you look at that doctor there? And this doctor here? Hmm? Which is the best looking? There we go. <laughs> Hey, right, Oliver. You keep safe, son, all right? Well done. It was an exciting helicopter flight, wasn't it? Yeah, he enjoyed it. Yeah, he loved it. He said his dad and his brother would be really jealous. 200 miles an hour he was going. Hey. Fast. Right, then I'll see you later. Thank you very much. Oh, good 
Be able to let the dock in. Oh, come on, admin. Catch the light. It is a dangerous game riding a horse, definitely. Uh, my, uh, I'm sure one day my little girl will do it, but I'll probably worry every time she does. I saved, saved his life, basically get him to the hospital, get him at the Freeman as fast as what they did, so they could get him sorted out straight away. Well, I'm very lucky to be here. And just, like I say, just take it to day as it comes and keep going as long as I can. It's going be a good few years yet. Now this is a good day. Yeah, this is what it's all about. You like to think that you bring something to the party because at the end of the day you are flying the aircraft but um, it's a team effort and it's the team that works. I remember thinking oh, we'll be home in quarter of an hour and then the next thing I knew I was underwater and uh, couldn't see anything, it was very black and you know, I remember thinking, if I don't get out, I'm going to drown. It's the best bit of the day. So you're very grateful, aren't you? Yeah. And when you get to be a big boy, you're going to do lots of fundraising for them, aren't you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> As long as it's not a, a sponsored um, motorbike ride, we don't mind. Anything else but that. <laughs> Can't wrap yourself in cotton wool. What if, what if, what if, what if? Otherwise, you'd never get on a plane and fly away on holiday. You'd be scared across the road. If you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too much room. Right, shall we work on getting him out and then reassess him? Yeah, he's under the pedals at the yeah. minute. Let's lift him out as he is on the floor. Put your arm round me, come on, help me to help you. This is a 22-year-old who's fallen and has a wooden post sticking out of his eye. Ah! <laughs> Trauma, statistically, is the biggest killer of young people and we see that on a weekly basis.